Well, I think we'll get started. Welcome everybody to ICAP Grand Rounds. My name is Elaine Abrams. I'm the Senior Director for Research at ICAP and Professor of Pediatrics and Epidemiology at Columbia University. It's really my pleasure to uh, welcome you all and introduce the speaker today for our grand rounds on social determinants of health and HIV among youth in high and low resource settings. Lessons learned from multi-country research. So just as a reminder, um, as always, we uh, will take questions for the panelists. Please use the Q&A box, not the chat box. We'll have plenty of time at the end of the presentation to address your questions. And remember that the webinar is being recorded and the slides will be posted at our website as always in case you miss part of the webinar or want to share it with your colleagues. So now I'd like to introduce our esteemed speaker, Dr. Carmen Lodi. She's the Canada Research Chair in Global Health Equity and Social Justice with Marginalized Populations, professor at the Factor in Wentash Faculty of Social Work, University of Toronto, adjunct professor of the United Nations University Institute for Water, Environment, and Health, and adjunct scientist of Women's College Hospital. Her research program advances understanding of and develops interventions to address stigma associated with HIV and other health disparities. Her current research focuses on HIV prevention, testing, and care cascades in Uganda, Kenya, Jamaica, Congo, and Canada with adolescents and youth, people living with HIV, refugee and displaced populations, LGBT communities and sex workers, and persons at the intersection of these identities. Her latest book, working with excluded populations in HIV, hard to reach or out of sight was published in 2021 by Springer. And she co-edited the book, LGBT Mental Health, International Perspective and Experiences. It was published in 2019 by the American Psychological Association. And if this wasn't enough, she also has a podcast you can find anywhere the podcasts are available called Everybody Hates Me, Let's Talk About Stigma, with guests on multiple forms of stigma. Um, she's doing some of the most exciting and forward-thinking work that I've seen in a long time, and I'm really excited to introduce her, have her speak today on Grand Rounds. So over to you now. Thank you so much for that really kind and uh, long introduction. Um, I'm very excited to be here today, and I'm going to be reflecting on. I'm just gonna I'm gonna turn my video back on for question and answer. But while I'm sharing my slides, I'm gonna turn my my video off. Um, so I'm gonna be reflecting today on the social determinants of health and HIV among youth in high and low income contexts. And to do that, I'm gonna share three case studies from our team's work. The first is our work with refugee adolescents and youth in Uganda. The second is a longstanding community-based research project with uh, colleagues in the Northwest Territories of Canada, working with Northern and indigenous youth. And the third is with LGBTQ youth in Jamaica. Let's see. I'm actually going to start at the end. Here are some key considerations when thinking about what shapes both engagement with the HIV prevention cascade um, 
from testing to uptake of various prevention modalities to the HIV care cascade. So this is, if all you leave with is this, this is, this is the key points. First is ecosyndemics, which refer to how conditions for poor health are more likely to occur under unstable environmental conditions coupled with economic inequalities. So really this refers to, like syndemics theory, the clustering and interaction between biological, social, environmental, and or psychological health challenges and how these interact to exacerbate negative health outcomes. Third, we'll be talking about resource scarcity, how structural level factors contribute to community level water and food insecurity vulnerabilities, and in turn, how these resource insecurities affect mental and physical health, household dynamics, stress and suffering, and in turn, sexual health. Fourth, we'll be talking about cumulative and chronic violence. So violence that youth experience in conflict, in communities, families, and partnerships that span childhood and adolescence and young adulthood. And finally, we'll be talking about constrained rights and agency. How one's access to self-determination, justice, and rights is not experienced equally based on multiple factors, including citizenship status, gender inequity, LGBTQ identities, and sex work and the criminalization of sex work and LGBTQ identities, for example. So the first case study is based on the last five years of multi-method research, including qualitative, quantitative, and intervention research in a cohort study and a randomized control trial working with refugee adolescents and youth in Uganda, Africa's largest refugee hosting nation with 1.5 million refugees. I'll be briefly touching on our findings that span these social determinants of health, including intersecting stigma, food and water insecurity, violence, and pandemic-related disrupted sexual and reproductive health care. Our qualitative findings uh, recently published align with the health stigma and discrimination framework to really underscore that among urban refugee youth in Kampala, what matters when we consider engagement in HIV testing is drivers and facilitators of stigma. These include fear of infection and misinformation, judgment, social and gender norms, as well as a legal environment and peer support. Urban refugee youth discussed with us stigma linked with being a refugee, being a sexually active adolescent or youth seeking HIV testing, sex work involvement, sexual diversity and sexual orientation, and gender inequities, as well as stigma around HIV. These converge to result in mistreatment, fear, shame, blame, and coercion in intimate partnerships, families, communities, police encounters, and in health centers. Ultimately, they reduced engagement in any HIV testing. And for those that had negative experiences while testing, they resulted in not wanting to further engage in healthcare. These findings align with a larger literature on intersectional stigma rooted in Black feminist theory that examine both the oppressions that occur at the intersection of multiple marginalization, as well as the opportunities for social support, solidarity, activism, and resistance, which we also documented with women living with HIV in Canada. Really intersecting stigma is the way that stigma research is evolving. And uh, we, I was actually part of an NIH group that launched a special issue on intersecting stigma in the American Journal of Public Health at the AIDS conference this year. You can find that as well as a special issue of the Journal of the International AIDS Society on getting to the heart of stigma. So you can look at those two special issues for, for recent um, uh, articles on stigma and intersecting stigma. I also want to note that we found that food insecurity was chronic and prevalent, affecting nearly 60% of youth before and 65% of youth during the pandemic. And it was associated with depression, lower HIV testing uptake, and increased engagement in transactional sex. This corresponds with the robust body of evidence that shows food insecurity is a driver of HIV via transactional sex and survival sex. We found that violence was also a chronic and cumulative experience with urban refugee youth. Among the sample of urban refugee youth, more than half experienced violence at the age of 16 or over, 54%, ref referring to this as young adulthood violence. And among those in relationships in the past 12 months, 
most 86% reported intimate partner violence. And this is higher for those who reported childhood abuse. In our recent BMJ Global Health paper, we found that there was an interaction between frequent alcohol use and intimate partner violence on reporting sexual risk factors. These included past three month multiple sex partners and past 12 month transactional sex. And there's an interaction between young adulthood violence and depression on transactional sex. The syndemics framework suggests that we could address problematic alcohol use, depression and or violence. And this may also reduce HIV vulnerabilities among urban refugee youth in this context. Food and water insecurity in the pandemic were also widespread and linked with HIV vulnerabilities. In the pandemic, we found in our cohort of 440 urban refugee youth that 65% reported food insecurity and 47% water insecurity. In adjusted analysis, water insecurity, and this was assessed with the validated scale, the HYs, water insecurity was associated with 2.5 higher likelihood of reporting unplanned pregnancy. 2.7 fold higher likelihood of transactional sex, as well as reduced se sexual relationship power and reduced condom efficacy. Food insecurity was also associated with disrupted sexual and reproductive health access. We also found water insecurity was associated with more than two fold higher risk of food insecurity. This aligns with an increased focus on climate change, in particular drought and water scarcity, on HIV risk via pathways of migration and survival sex. It also aligns with research from Kenya discussing water insecurity as a driver of food insecurity. It is important to consider the COVID pandemic as a driver of HIV risk in this context. We found that 30% of this cohort reported reduced reproductive health services in the pandemic, including oral contraceptives, and 30% reported reduced sexual health services, including condoms and HIV and STI testing. During the pandemic, one in 10 young women respondents reported unplanned pregnancy, and 7% reported transactional sex. Disrupted sexual and reproductive health care is due to a constellation of factors, increased poverty, reduced money to travel to clinics, lockdowns, and clinic closures, and or a focus on COVID-19 at health clinics. Finally, I want to note a positive. We conducted a randomized control trial of an HIV self-testing study with one arm also receiving HIV self-testing alongside M Health support among this cohort of urban refugee youth in the pandemic. The M Health support included bi-directional text messaging with support from peer navigators. It was the first time HIV self-testing has been implemented with refugee youth or refugees at large. The results, which are currently under peer review, are highly significant. Testing increased in the HIV self-testing arm from 27.6% at baseline to 98.6% at eight months. In the HIV self-testing plus mHealth arm, testing increased from 30.9% at baseline compared to 94.2% at eight months. Compared with the standard of care, which increased from 35.5% at baseline to 36.7% at eight months which you can see in the, in the graph here is the blue line is a standard of care, the green is a self-testing alone, and the red is a self-testing plus M health. Youth in the HIV self-testing plus M health arm also had lower adolescent sexual and reproductive health stigma, while those in the HIV self-testing alone arm had higher HIV stigma and adolescent sexual and reproductive health stigma. M health could thus have a protective role in buffering stigma. We also verified HIV status knowledge with point of care testing, and we found in both intervention arms, uh, knowledge of one's HIV status as verified by POCT was higher um, than standard of care. 100% in the HIV self-testing alone arm, 98% in the HIV self-testing plus M health arm versus 61.5% in the standard of care at 12 months. Um, very briefly, I'll discuss our work for the past three years in BDBD Refugee Settlement. It's one of the largest refugee settlements in the world with 240,000 residents, largely from South Sudan. It's in northern Uganda at the border of South Sudan. Our mixed methods study began with qualitative methods, finding gender inequities such as violence, both during conflict, in families, and in intimate partnerships forced early and child marriage, 
and poverty linked with food, firewood, and water insecurity, as well as survival sex and chronic traumatic violence were all interlocking, were all interlocking factors that increased exposure to HIV and other sexual health disparities. We developed a participatory comic book based on qualitative findings to increase post-rape care engagement, including um, increased post-exposure prophylaxis awareness and acceptance, reduce sexual violence stigma, and increase bystander practices in order for youth to safely respond to violence. Uh, we also had a program for healthcare providers to similarly reduce sexual violence stigma, increase post-rape care tailored for youth, and um, increase youth-friendly service delivery. Uh, we recently published the findings with youth, which noted that we did reach these goals among the sample of refugee adolescents and youth aged 16 to 24, where we found reduced sexual violence stigma, increased post-exposure prophylaxis, knowledge and acceptance, increased bystander advocacy and resilient coping. And among the healthcare providers, which this, this uh, paper is still in peer review, uh, we noted increased youth-friendly service provision, bystander efficacy and resilient coping. We are now integrating participatory comics aligned with the HIV prevention cascade with refugee youth in this context of BDBD to support another HIV self-testing trial, which to be, as, as far as we know, uh, the first HIV self-testing trial done with youth within a refugee settlement context. And so these comics also include trauma and violence-aware decision-making for partner HIV testing, as well as HIV stigma reduction. For the second case, I wanna briefly share some research with Northern and Indigenous youth in the Northwest Territories, Canada, where I've been working since 2014 in collaboration with co-principal investigator, Dr. Candice Liss, who co-founded FOXY, Fostering Open Expression Among Youth, and SMASH, Strength, Masculinities, and Sexual Health, which are arts-based sexual health programs with and for Northern and Indigenous youth. Her qualitative and quantitative findings have highlighted the social determinants of health and HIV among this population include food insecurity, alcohol and drug use, depression, violence, and sexual relationship power, all of which should be, all of which should be understood through a lens that both considers the intergenerational impact of colonization and residential schools which were the highest per capita in the Northwest Territories, as well as disconnection from culture and land, and from a strength-based lens that examines culture as healing and empowering, which is what Foxy and SMASH do. We have consistently tried to document the influence of contextual factors, such as food insecurity, on Northern and Ind Indigenous youth aged 13 to 18, and their condom use and sexual self-efficacy, as well as mental health, and the interplay I discussed earlier with the syndemic interactions between depression, substance use, and HIV vulnerabilities. For instance, whenever a latest analysis and peer review shows the pathways from food insecurity to lower resilience and increased depression to reduced safer sex self-efficacy. We also found that LGBTQ-related stigma discrimination, and larger contexts of hetero and cisnormativity, the expectations and assumptions that everyone is or should be straight and cisgender negatively impacted sexual and physical health among LGBTQ youth in the Northwest Territories and were exacerbated by rurality. As I mentioned, Foxy and its counterpart for young men, SMASH, both open to gender diverse youth, hold school-based workshops that integrate multiple arts-based methods including body mapping, theater, and role play, and elders' teachings, working from a sex-positive framework, as well as peer leadership with land-based retreats with traditional teachings at a fly-in lodge that we have found are linked with increased safer sex efficacy, HIV and STI knowledge, and in a forthcoming paper, empowerment and leadership. The final case, is with our ongoing research with LGBTQ youth aged 16 to 24 in Jamaica, a long-standing collaboration with Jamaica Aid Support for Life, a community-based aid service organization in Kingston, St. Anne, and Montego Bay. Since 2013, we have documented HIV stigma and LGBTQ stigma and criminalization 
as well as sex work stigma and criminalization as social determinants of health and HIV for young LGBTQ persons in Jamaica. Building on this HIV prevention work, we started a qualitative study with LGBTQ youth and young sex workers living with HIV in Kingston, Montego Bay, and St. Anne. Our key findings, as noted here, include intersecting stigma, including HIV stigma linked with low treatment literacy, such as fear of infection and assumptions that people with HIV are, in quotes, already dead, LGBTQ and sex work stigma. These create profound barriers to accessing and taking medication and result in isolation from family and friends, and in turn, these lower self-esteem and harm mental health. Other barriers include accessing safe housing, secure employment, and sufficient food, all of which result in poverty, and food security is another barrier to medication adherence. For instance, participants discuss being stigmatized for being gay, as well as for living with HIV, losing employment when they tested HIV positive, and being told by healthcare providers, for instance, in this case, that their children or their daughter, in this example, can't share their utensils or soap. These experiences cause incredible distress and many participants mention wanting to die. Um, some examples here that, that I, I'll share with you from a young gay man, they don't know that HIV is not a killer like cancer. So HIV is just a thing that they scorn in being an MSM or a man who has sex with men. In Jamaica, that's the first stigmatization. Sex workers, they also judge those people. A sex worker described, the nurse said, my daughter can't use the same sheets and towels that I use. She can't use the same bar soap that I use to bathe with or the plates and utensils I use. I said, what am I living for then? I should just go to the beach and dive off. And so I went to the beach and dived off. Trust me, I'm not telling you a lie. And then the third example from a trans woman, um, when I went in and did the test and they found out I have HIV, they said, I can't get the job anymore. In my mind, I wanted to kill myself <clears throat> because I kept saying, what is this? What is this? Because, because it's as if your life is over. I was saying my life is done. So how am I gonna survive? And what am I going to do? Building on these findings, <clears throat> sorry, for my, clearing my throat. I'm um, building on these findings, we created a comic series that spanned the HIV care cascade from testing to diagnosis, to adherence, to living positively. We also created blank versions that were then used as an interview tool with young LGBTQ persons and sex workers for them to film their own responses and experiences. This is an example of um, a comic that shows many of the medication ad adherence barriers, hunger, no transport funds to the clinic, stressing about telling one's partner and confidentiality concerns at clinics and pharmacies. This is my favorite comic that reflects findings on the ways in which young people are living positively with HIV, including accessing support groups, friends, taking medication to look good, living for their children, and inspiring others like them and in their same situation. Here's an example of how participants filled the comics out themselves in the individual interviews after looking at the ones that we created. And moving forward, and this is an image from a comic book we made in Uganda actually, our colleagues in Jamaica want to focus on the strategies identified for living positively with HIV among young people as a space for intervention. For instance, we're talking about possibly using local dance as a form of intervention. Uh, stay tuned. So I just returned on Friday from a month away where last week I was visiting a project we are doing with very young adolescents aged 10 to 14 in six climate affected regions in Kenya. Youth are affected by climate change and its impacts on food, water and sanitation security. Yet very young adolescents, those who are aged 10 to 14, their voices are often overlooked. So we have a small study looking at pathways from climate change to food, water and sanitation insecurity to sexual health including sexual violence outcomes among very young adolescents. This involves walk-along interviews where youth take a tablet or a GoPro 
and video a daily walk along with the interviewer when they're collecting water. We also had them share with us where they access toilets and access food. A postdoctoral fellow working on our team, Dr. Sarah Van Borek, made a short video compilation of the videos taken by youth in one of these contexts, the Mathari slum in Nairobi. And we created a meta narrative or composite narrative synthesizing themes from the key findings shared by youth on their journeys to collect water. I will share the video we made with youth in the Mathari slum now. We actually used this video last week as a conversation starter for a participatory mapping process we are conducting with very young adolescents living in Mathari so they can envision and map community solutions and elicit, um, we elicited their recommendations for social change. I, I wanted to uh, assure you that we have research ethics board approval for this methodology, as well as youth assent and parental consent for sharing the video for educational purposes. And we have also uh, erased, uh, blurred out the faces for confidentiality. So I wanna make sure that the, the sound is being shared. Hapa madhare kuna changamoto nyingi kwa vijana kama mimi hasa kuhusiana na vitu tunavyotumia kila siku kama maji, chakula na vio. Mimi huchota maji sana sana na watoto na wanawake katika sehemu ya kukusanyia maji ambapo nalipia maji. Mimi hulipa shilingi tano kwa vyombo viwili vya lita kumi. Maji haya yanapatikana siku fulani za wiki. Wakati mwingine sina pesa za maji na itanibidi kuchukua mkopo katika vituo vya maji. Watoto wengine wanaweza kunichekelea na hii hunifanya ni hisi vibaya. Naogopa kwenda sehemu za maji wakati wa usiku au mapema sana asubuhi kwa sababu naweza kutekwa nyara au kubakwa. Wakati hakuna maji ya kutosha huwa tunapata shida shuleni. Kama msichana kuhusu swala la hedhi kila mwezi ikiwa hakuna maji ya kuoga itakosa kwenda shuleni ili kuepuka aibu Hata wavulana wanaweza kukosa shule ili wauze maji wakati hayatoshi Wakati mwingine nitaenda kuchota maji na kujipata nimesimama kwa muda nikingoja laini ndefu hivi sitaweza kufanya kazi niliyobeba nyumbani Wakati kuna maji mengi kutoka kwa mvua kubwa, tuna shida vile vile kwa shule. Tunaweza kukumbwa na mafuriko na maji yatafikia vitanda na vitabu vyetu. Pia tunaweza kupoteza umeme, hivi kwamba hatuwezi kusoma usiku. Katika msimu wa mvua kuna shida zingine pia. Ninapoenda kuchota maji, wanaume wengine hunijaribu kwa kunipa maji ikiwa nitakubali kufanya jambo fulani na wao. Jambo ambalo hutendeka kati ya watu wakubwa wakati kama usiku. Nimesikia wasichana wengi wakifanya mambo haya na wanaume ili wapate maji ya kuoga wapatapo hevi yao. Tuna mto hapa tunaita Rowe, ni mto wa takataka. Mimi hutupa takataka mtoni kwa sababu hakuna mahali haswa pa kutupia takataka. Kila mtu hufanya hivi. Mto huo ni mchafu sana na una takataka nyingi. Wakati mwingine unaweza kupata kinyesi na damu kwenye mto. Watu wanaweza kupata magonjwa huko. Hii inanifanya ni hisi vibaya. Ninaogopa kwenda mtoni hasa wakati wa usiku kwa sababu mambo mabaya yanaweza kutokea huko. Unaweza kupata watu wabaya huko ambao wanaweza kukuibia, kukuteka nyara, kukubaka au kukufanya uache shule. Wakati wa mvua kubwa, mto hufurika na kufikia nyumba zilizojengwa karibu na unaweza hata kukubeba. Ninaogopa kuanguka mtoni. Sitaki kunywa maji hayo kwa bahati mbaya na hata pengine kuzama. Wakati kuna uhaba wa maji, saa zingine tunalazimika kuchota maji mtoni. Kuhusu changamoto za maji, tuna njia tofauti ambazo tunakabiliana nazo. Kwa mfano, wakati kituo kimoja cha maji kimekauka, tunaweza kwenda kwenye vituo vingine vya maji au majirani na wanafamilia wanaweza kusaidiana. 
kunaponyesha na sehemu za maji kufungwa huwa tunaweka ndoo beseni au matengi yetu ili kukusanya maji ya mvua pia tunatia magunia juu ya paa ili kuzuia mvua kuingia ndani ya nyumba mto unapofurika na kufikia nyumba zilizo karibu nao watu wanaoishi huko wanahamishwa hadi maeneo ya juu mpaka maji yarudi chini tena katika kupanga laini ya kuchota maji watu huheshimu mwenendo huu watasubiri hadi wakati wao ikiwa mtu alikuwa mbele na ikabidi aondoke ataviacha vyombo vyake hapo na kumjulisha mtu kwamba atarudi hizi ni baadhi ya njia tunazokabiliana na changamoto za maji huku madhare hapa madhare una so what you might have heard in this video are the linkages between water insecurity, weather, safety concerns, specifically rape and kidnapping, missing school among very young adolescents, and transactional sex, highlighting the urgent need to better understand the links between water insecurity and sexual health and well being among very young adolescents living in slums and other resource scarce settings. To sum up, this morning we have talked about access to resources, power, and survival needs. These concepts help to encapsulate some of this thinking. Ecosyndemics, how ecological, physical, and social environments interact with health issues and inequalities to increase HIV vulnerabilities. Intersecting stigma, including adolescent sexual and reproductive health stigma. This is very understudied in HIV and other stigma research. Uh, concurrent resource scarcity, including food and water insecurity. We have a robust knowledge of how food insecurity is linked with HIV and those bidirectional relationships. We have a much less developed conceptual model and empirical understanding of the linkages between water insecurity and HIV. Fourth, violence is chronic and cumulative and the importance of exploring all of the different venues that violence occurs and life stages. And finally, constrained rights and agency, including what factors constrain sexual relationship power and sexual self-efficacy. I wanna leave with critical hope, how we find hope for change in the midst of injustice and some other determinants of health and well-being. Uh, these include flourishing, what does it mean to live a good life? social and community connectedness and solidarity, multi-level resilience, and this very useful concept of sexual well-being from a recent article by Mitchell that includes sexual respect, sexual safety, sexual self-esteem, and sexual self-determination. This is a critical facet that is linked with sexual health but extends beyond it. I'm also a huge proponent of sexual pleasure and sex positivity in our HIV and our sexual health research. So increasing access to LGBTQ and sex work inclusive, comprehensive sexuality education. If you're not aware of the work of the Pleasure Project and particularly Annie Philpott, I would suggest you, you look at that. She really documents in the Pleasure Project documents the sexual health benefits of sexual pleasure focused education and service delivery. The World Association for Sexual Health has a declaration on sexual pleasure. I also encourage you all to read. It highlights sexual pleasure as integral for sexual health promotion, comprehensive sexuality, comprehensive sexual health education, as well as services. And I want to also thank the enormous amount of people and teams behind all of this work, including the participants, the peer research assistants, uh, the Ugandan team. There's a lot of people, too many to mention, but in particular, I want to note Uganda Refugee and Disaster Management Council and BDBD and the Young African Refugees for Integral Development, or YARID, in Kampala, as well as the International Research Consortium in Kampala and the Uganda Ministry of Health. I want to acknowledge the Northwest Territories team, in particular, Dr. Candice Liss, Foxy and Smash, of the Jamaica team, including Jamaica Aid Support for Life, Kandasi Levermore and Patrick Lalore, the Kenyan team, Elim Trust, uh, Julia, Dr. Julia Kagunda, Claire Kokochi, Ika Nemayara, and Mercy Wanjiru, uh, the wonderful University of Toronto team, including Leslie Giddings, Miranda Lutat, Isha Berry, 
Elisa McAlpine, Holly Donkers, Luke Courtner and Sarah Van Borek, who, who made the video, as I mentioned, and all the funders, Grand Challenges Canada, CIHR, IDRC, SHRC, Canada Research Chairs, and the artists for the comics that you saw, including Petroglyph Comics and Janine Carrington. Uh, feel free to contact me and um, you can check out our Shine Lab. The podcasts are there. Uh, many of these comics are, are are there in multiple languages and they're ready for you to download and to use in your own work. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Well, um, I'm back on and I just want to thank you um, for a magnificent talk and just for all the sensational work. Um, I I think we are seeing some questions already. I certainly have many of my own, but let me start with some of the questions that um, have been, been posted. And I'll, I'll begin by saying they're all commenting on what a fantastic talk this was. Before, so I won't repeat that each time. So um, one question is whether you find, you found that there are key ways that intersecting stigma varies or changes across the adolescent age range. For example, the experience of a 16-year-old versus a, a 22-year-old. I definitely think that um, adolescent sexual reproductive health stigma, what's really interesting about that is there, are, we did a a confirmatory a factor analysis of the adolescent sexual and reproductive health stigma scale. And we found there was actually different dimensions. One was around wanting to use uh, modern family planning methods. One was around teen pregnancy. So I think for adolescents that are around 16, 17, even 18, they experience, um, and I think we've, we've documented this at least anecdotally, and I think in our, our data, they experience more stigma for being pregnant if they're younger. And I mean, it's so ironic. They experience stigma for being pregnant and they experience stigma for going into a clinic and wanting to access contraception or, or STI and HIV testing. So I think it is still more socially judged, uh, sexually active youth and, and, and teen pregnancy. Uh, also, I would say from spending time with the 10 to 14 year olds, um, menstruation stigma is really, really uh, high among that group. I'm actually going to be going in a few weeks to Australia to do a talk at the Global Period Poverty Forum. And their, one of their focuses is on menstruation stigma. So I'm going to see how we can actually use some of our health stigma discrimination frameworks to really understand menstruation st stigma which is really structural as well. When you don't have access to uh, toilets and water, like sanitation insecurity and water insecurity, it really exacerbates your likelihood of, of being exposed to menstruation stigma. When you're not able to wash your clothes, you're not able to wash your body, when you're not able to access menstruation hygiene management products. And so that is definitely amplified for, for younger adolescents, even I only showed you one video. We actually have a different video for sanitation and security, which really talks about challenges that young people have managing um, their menstruation when they're in these really resource constrained contexts. And so there is a lot of stigma. Um, the other way that I would say age impacts this is with regard to sexual violence stigma. Uh, we found that the, the younger the girls experienced sexual violence in the refugee camp, the more likely they were forced into child, um, child early and forced marriage. So that was often because of the sexual violence stigma, which is so profound that families think that nobody will wanna marry a girl or a young woman if they've experienced sexual violence. So they're often forced to marry their perpetrator. So that has so many negative consequences for a girl's life. Um, and also really reduces uh, people wanting to ever report experiencing sexual violence stigma if you know that you're going to be uh, forced to marry the, the person who perpetrated that violence. So that a lot of this has got to do with how young people have less agency and less power 
in in their lives i'm not saying necessarily a 20 year old has a lot of power and agency but compared to say a 10 year old or even a 16 year old i think the the level of confidence and self-efficacy might be might be lower i don't want to say a negative like i don't want this to come across as stigmatizing very young adolescents because i was blown away by how smart and uh like completely insightful young people were they they came up with like lists of recommendations of how how their environments can be improved. So I also want to say that young people do have agency, but I do see that a lot of the stigma experiences, especially when it comes to sexual violence, menstruation, and, and accessing sexual reproductive health services, seems to be amplified for the younger adolescents. And maybe suggests that you have to tailor interventions along the developmental spectrum absolutely it was really interesting even just the language that people used i don't i don't know if you noticed in the video we were really really careful and we obviously worked extremely closely with the kenyan team around creating that that composite narrative that was sort of a highlight of the main themes in our findings but nobody said things like transactional sex or survival sex or even sex they said the things that adults do at night that's that's how the youth are speaking so it's really i think important to say things that, that they will understand and and when we showed this to, to the youth last week they were like absolutely fascinated but it was also very sobering so we had to do i think a lot of after that we had to do some more fun and playful activities because when we're telling interventions, we have to remember how how painful these things can be, even if these are half of the youth were the youth that were in these interviews and half of them were different youth. But even just seeing this reflected back to you, um, we did notice we had to we had to really frame the participatory mapping from a joyful space um, and a more of a pleasure focused versus rehashing all of the challenges because it, it can get extremely uh, depressing for youth to be continually talking about their, their problems. So really always bringing in a strength based, a solutions focus and engaging them in creating the solutions um, was, was important for us working with, with youth, as well as like, obviously a lot of activities and, and being as playful as possible. It was very sobering for the audience as well. So let me shift to another question. Um, someone is asking if you could elaborate on how participatory comics are created and how they're meant to work? So that's a great question. We did publish the protocol um, in Global Health Action. It was something that we I sort of combined comic development with participatory theater into this approach because of the pandemic. The original goal was to go and create comics with the the young people. Obviously, the pandemic happened. And so what we did was we used the qualitative data to come up with some scenarios that we workshopped with youth and we workshopped with the community. And so that we have and you can find these on our, our website in multiple languages. They're open access. You can download them. And so they they, they tell a story, a narrative of a young woman who experienced sexual violence and her friend and, you know, going through being teased at school, accessing healthcare, um, and, you know, shows the healthcare system. It, it's, it's, it really shows a continuum. And every, every comic, we actually, the way we make it is we have the theory, we have the evidence base, we have the key principles, and then we have how is this narrative going to be able to reflect that that's rooted in that in the quality of data. It's actually quite a complex process just to create these comics and make sure that they are evidence based and then they reflect the qualitative data. And then I was I was worried that we would just be giving youth these comics that were created and not really having a participatory element. So I said, well, why don't we give them the comics that are created, but then also give them a blank version where they would fill them in themselves. It was such a hit. And so we were doing this all virtually. So the whole team in, in BDBD were, were doing this. And they said it was such a hit. The youth wanted more. They were making copies. They wanted more copies of these comics. So what we ended up doing was laminating them and delivering them, like, um, I would say never mail comics, <laughs> get them printed wherever you need them, um, but laminating them because you can clean them, keep them at health centers. And you can also re, like, you can, you can write in them and then clean them and write in them again. They're reusable. Um, 
And so that way, youth are making their own, they're writing their own responses in whatever language they want or drawing their own responses. And that that really was like a shift, I think. I, I haven't seen anybody use comics that specific way. There is a history of, of graphic medicine, uh, which is really fascinating how comics have been used for education purposes. There's the U equals U intervention, um, GOSE, um, G-O-G-H-O-S-E, published in um, AIDS and Behavior, an example of how comics were used. But this participatory approach I'm, I'm not sure I've seen anything exactly like that, but we published the protocol and the findings. And then we decided to use it as a data collection tool in the work I showed you in Jamaica. So we would we also created those, those um, four comics and then a blank version. And that was actually a really great way for discussion. Not everybody likes to sit and have a face-to-face -face interview. And so that was sort of a fun way. So we're, we're seeing it used as an inter intervention as well as a data collection tool and now we're using it again as an intervention around hiv self-testing because you know you don't really need to be have a high level literacy either you can just sort of write a comment or a, a happy face and a, an emoji <laughs> you don't have to to write a copious amounts of words uh, but i think that it just creates that um something different i i I, I feel like there's an excitement also people seeing their lives reflected in the comic. A lot of times people have asked me, can we just use these comics in different contexts? Um, we took everything into consideration in each comic, like the color of the earth, how people do their hair, what people wear. So I, I, I mean, I want it to be used in different contexts, but I'm also really conscious that that we want to make sure that people see themselves in that in that comic as well. So um, and, and that was kind of a long answer, but it was something, it was sort of an iterative process to try to make these, these, these comics participatory. So it sounds as though they were informed by the quality and developed from a kind of sort of, uh, with, with in a framework informed by qualitative research, but then also became an intervention and a research tool. Absolutely. So we had the, the theory of- spectrum, really. Yeah, we have like the theory of change and, and for the current one with the HIV self-testing, I think I, I showed a picture of that for the HIV self-testing intervention, we're actually using a conceptual model of the HIV prevention cascade. And we have comics aligned with the motivation dimensions, the access dimensions that are rooted in the qualitative data. So we we, we coded all the qualitative data, we looked at the theory and we, we create like a grid where there's the theoretical constructs, there's the key themes from the qualitative data, and then there's some examples. So we're really trying to use an evidence-based process for our space methods. I think as we've discussed in the past, they're not nimble because they are so context specific. So, they are con yeah i yeah. mean we're doing virtual reality as well um i didn't talk about that and we're doing that in kampala around mental health and that is i'm um, compared to virtual reality comics are very cost effective <laughs> they're very cheap <laughs> virtual reality has been much more challenging than i um imagined uh but we're we're using it as a mental health and a stigma reduction around mental health intervention Moving forward, I don't think I would do another virtual reality, specifically interactive intervention, but I think that we're going to be using the 360 degree videos in, in Kenya as a way of still being immersive in trying to build empathy. But the interactivity with the virtual reality, I think it just really is so context specific because some people are really, really confident using technology. like. Uh, one of our postdocs on our team took the virtual reality to South Africa and showed it to folks there. They wanted it to be so much more interactive. We had to reduce the interactivity just so people could figure out how to move around the scene. And so I do think that there's this, this really important level of context specificity that we have to think about. Okay, so let's go to another, another, another question. Um, what is your experience tracking linkage to HIV care and treatment after self-testing? And what did you employ the M-Health approach for linkage to care? Yeah, we really, that was what we were most excited about. And then we launched the intervention in February, 2020. And so it was literally during the pandemic. So 
two challenges we had, three challenges we had were uh, the hard lockdowns in Kampala where people couldn't leave their house. There was no public transport. So we did have this WellTel system, um, W-E-L-T-E-L, -E which is the bi-directional text messaging system. That, that was what we had. We also had um, WhatsApp groups uh, for peer. Each, each person was linked with a peer navigator who was also a refugee youth. We've been working with this, a group of 12 refugee youth um, since 2017 who are the peer navigators. Um, so we tried as much as possible that, you know, we worked with clinics uh, to get them ready for the youth coming. <laughs> And then we had the pandemic. Uh, the other issue we had and one of the limitations of our study was we clearly didn't get youth that were uh, at high risk of HIV. So we had one sero conversion, which uh, we found and supported that person. There could have been more people, but I what I think is that, and, and this is what we're going to be doing in BDBD, and we met with UNHCR, they're like, in just the general population of refugee, there's not going to be uh, a high prevalence. So we really have to get refugees who are engaged in sex work, who are LGBTQ refugees, who are you know more more precariously um, situated that are that have a, a, an elevated risk. So although our main goal was was using <laughs> M Health to see if this will uh, increase linkage to care, because of the disruption from the pandemic to the actual care, and because of the low number of people who actually seroconverted, we really weren't able to test if the M Health increased that linkage to care. I'm hoping because we're doing much more um, rigorous screening for eligibility and BDBD that will and, and because the I don't want to say the pandemic is over. <laughs> the pandemic is not over, but health systems are are, are open and they're operating um, within BDBD. And we are doing trainings in the health system around HIV stigma, um, creating coupons so people can go and 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 get their confirmatory test with SETI coupons. Is something we did before in Jamaica. So I'm hopeful that I'll be able to have a better answer for you after the next trial. Great. So. Um... Somebody is um, addressing the asking about water insecurity <laughs> and addressing water insecurity needs a multi-sectoral approach. How, how do you begin to, ta to tackle, tackle this? And I think that could probably be expanded to many of the other climate crisis induced you know, problems. Well, we need more people at the table from these different disciplines. I spent a week in August uh, at the World Water Week. It's one of the largest in, in Stockholm. We were one of the only health presentations there. It was all engineering. And we did a, we did a presentation on syndemics and water insecurity. We, we presented our mental health data, our sexual health data, and BDBD and Kampala. And we had like about 40, 50 really interested people there. And there, but whenever anybody said, what kind of water research do you do? I'm like, well, I do HIV research. They're like, why are you here? And I'm like, I'm wondering that, why am I here? Because I don't think there's enough venues for the engineers to come in with the um, sexual health researchers. So I have on our team, we have engineers, we have water and sanitation hygiene people. So I think that it's about building those um, networks because some of the solutions to water and security, we're not gonna be able to fix. But some of the, the recommendations from youth, solar lighting, is that an, an impossible problem. Um, some of the recommendations from you are, 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 I think, relatively simple. I'm pretty sure the engineers on our team could figure it out. In the rainy season, it gets so muddy, I keep falling when I'm collecting. Can't you have a platform or something, a piece of wood around the, this is what the youth are saying. In the rainy season, my shoes keep falling into the toilet because I'm too short. Isn't there something that you could do to fix that? These don't seem like they're going to cost a million dollars. It seems like these are pretty basic solutions. So I think that they, there could be a range of cost. You know, there's going to be, are we going to be building wells? Probably not. But can we be engaging communities and thinking about what what solutions are there for addressing gender inequity and violence, at least, for addressing the fact that children are missing school, for, for addressing the fact that, 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 that a lot of people are not using um, public toilets because they're at night, uh, because they're afraid of sexual violence. So they're either using buckets in their house. So I think that there's a range of solutions and some of them are very overwhelming and, and, and cost intensive and some could be really, at, um, I think, at the youth and community level could think of some solutions. So 
we all need to work together and I have more engineers on our teams and wash experts. That's my my very quick answer to that. Well, I think you're advocating for multidisciplinary research as well as as, as solutions. And um, sadly, we we are at the end of our, our hour. I think we would all love to just stay on and keep keep talking, but I wanna thank you for the for the great talk and conversation and, and thank you for your important work to let remind everybody that the the, um, the webinar will be available online taped. You'll also be able to find to see the, the slides which have all the various papers that Carmen um, mentioned. And just to tell everybody that our next Grand Rounds will be October 18th on COVID-19 and older New Yorkers, findings from the Silver to Survey. So thank you again, Carmen. Thank you thank for you inviting for me. Comments. And, and some people mentioned French. There are French comics, so you could check well, out the website. Okay. <laughs> Thank Great. you so much for having yeah, me. And and the website, I assume, is in your slide in one of your slides. Yes, right. it's in the last the last slide. Okay, so. fantastic. Thank, Thank you again you. for having me. Okay, bye bye.